hello everyone. My name is Claire Bright and I am the director of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment uh, on behalf of Nova School of Law and of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. I would like to welcome you all to that uh, fifth and last episode of our webinar series on business and human rights in Southern Europe. Um, today, the spotlight uh, is on Greece. And I would like to express my gratitude to our keynote speaker, uh, Special Secretary, Mr. Fotis Komousis, as well as to our uh, stellar panel of speakers, who will be introduced in just a moment for having accepting our invitation today. I would also like to warmly thank our chair, um, Ilyas Pantekas. Ilyas is a professor of law at uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University. He is a member of the Qatar Foundation and an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University and on a Walsh uh, School of Foreign Service. He has published very widely. So some of his key uh, books include a recent publication such as International Human Rights Law in Practice, uh, Introduction to International Arbitration, and uh, the Cambridge Companion on Business and Human Rights, all published with Cambridge University Press. Um, and the latest is going, uh, is forthcoming and will be published in April this year. I would also like to thank uh, Lara, uh, uh, Laura Inigo Alvarez, who has recently joined the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment as a postdoctoral researcher for hosting uh, this webinar today. And finally, I just wanted to let everyone know that the webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available uh, freely afterwards. Uh, and now, without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor to our chair, uh, Ilias Van Pekes. Ilias, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the brief introduction. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone as well. As a Greek national, I'm you know, embarrassed to say that I don't know too much about uh, the business human rights landscape in Greece. But you know, Greece is a, is, a, is, a, is a country that doesn't have huge enterprise, doesn't have a huge uh, industry, apart from you know, some, some in, the, in the mineral sector and some, and some other enterprises. So, but it's an interesting example for business human rights because uh, you know, we, we don't usually discuss situations where there, there are no multinational corporations. And so you know, where there's, a, there's, a, there's an austere financial environment uh, you know, imposed by multinational lenders, uh, and then you have a number of, you know, mainly medium and small business enterprises, and you know the the you know, the, the the CSR or the business human rights aspects of that are generally you know, they go unnoticed. Uh, so I think you know today's speakers will, will shed light uh, on uh, on these phenomena, especially as we go through. You know, CSR was I guess a thing of the past, and you know the the uh, non. Uh, compulsory compliance with rules, you know, soft law made up mainly by the enterprise themselves. Now, thankfully, we're going to a more regulated environment, and uh, hopefully, you know, countries in the south uh, uh, will will uh, will follow suit. Le I would like to introduce the our keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Fotis uh, Krumusis, who is the special secretary for private debt management at the Ministry of Finance. He's a member of the board directors of the Hellenic Development Bank, and deputy head of the Council of Equifund at the Ministry of Development and Investment. In the past, he served as Special Advisor for Sustainable Development Issues in international organizations, uh, such as the UN and the European Commission. He also served as Special Advisor to the Ministry of Finance, focusing on tax and custom administration, as well as information systems, uh, as well as at the Ministry of Economy and Development, again, focusing on investment issues. Uh, he served as Special Advisor to the Ministry of Environment, Energy and Climate Change, uh, focusing again on sustainability issues and in his long career, he's also served as special advisor to the Minister of Agriculture, focusing on the CAP, on the Common Agricultural Policy. So, Kromosis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> and I wish you all a happy new year. And I hope that uh, very soon we, uh, that all this COVID pandemic is uh, concluded and we can uh, uh, go back to the way things were. Up to now, we are in uh, social distancing all day, teleworking, quarantine, etc., etc. here in Athens. Uh, I will speak very shortly in order to allow time later on for further uh, questions and discussion. 
uh, in uh, in the Ministry of Finance in Greece, uh, we the new government came uh, after the elections of uh, July uh, 2019, uh, and uh, uh, a decision was made that uh, in all public procurement uh, we would like to incorporate. Uh, criteria related to social and environmental aspects. In Greece, there was no uh, know-how, and this has never been done in the past. Uh, so we had to start it from scratch, and that's why we contacted uh, various stakeholders, such as the CSR Last Network, uh, in order to provide to us uh, their feedback and, and what needs to be done. A major aspect of this uh, process was that the public procurement should incorporate um, specific criteria uh, related to the social and environmental performance of the candidate uh, companies who wish to apply to public procurement tenders. For this reason, we uh, developed some criteria, uh, not as exclusion criteria, uh, but as a bonus criteria. In this way, uh, we allow time to all the candidate companies to uh, implement any necessary actions uh, in order to fulfill these uh, social and environmental criteria. Uh, namely, we have um, five different aspects that we evaluate. The first one is the overall policies related to sustainability and uh, sustainable uh, development and CSR uh, aspects of the candidate companies. The second is uh, the, the policies and actions uh, related to the protection of employees and in general of labor rights, uh, including uh, actions for disabled uh, persons, um, gender equality, etc., etc. The third aspect is the implementation of, act, of actions uh, towards uh, supporting the society, such as non-governmental organizations and uh, selecting uh, local suppliers and other uh, such uh, factors. The fourth one is implementing actions in favor of the environment, such as recycling or uh, reusing materials or uh, energy efficiency. And the final uh, criteria, the fifth criteria, is implementing actions related to uh, governance and um, uh, combating uh, bribery and in favor of transparency. Thus, in the related to today's uh, workshop, in the second uh, axis related to labor uh, rights and respective uh, issues, we incorporated. Uh, specific uh, requirements uh, related to human rights. And uh, an example would be whether the, co the candidate company would, fol would, would fol fulfill uh, the international standards, uh, legislation and actions related to these issues. Uh, so this is what we have done. It's only the first step, but it's very crucial for us. Uh, we hope to enhance it in the future, and we welcome to learn more via the discussion as we have today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kormusis, for the uh, uh, for the very enlightening discussion and what and the new measures. I mean, some are a continuation, uh, but it's it's really positive what has been done uh, so far, and uh, specifically the reference to human rights because that's integral to the discussion on um, on, on on any policy related to um, the development of business, especially from the perspective of um, CSR. Um, we will have, the, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna have um, the speakers in sequence. Uh, there are questions for each speaker, one question for each speaker. And, um, and uh, um, at the end of the round, so to, to, to avoid a, a lengthy webinar, we're gonna have a, another set of questions which have already been um, uh, posed and if there is time at the at the very end of that then we're going to have questions a q, q a session if there is time but the idea is that we finish um uh, is it um, half past one uh, of whatever time is is there 
Uh, next is my good friend, Maria Gavonelli. Um, uh, Maria is an associate professor of international law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Athens. She's been teaching for the last five years, the only business human rights class uh, in Greece. She, she was a Fulbright scholar at uh, Berkeley in 2018-19. She's a research uh, assistant fellow, assistant research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London from 2005 uh, to 2019. She is the president of the Greek National Commission for Human Rights and a member of the managing board, National Transparency Authority. She's a senior policy advisor for the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, Eliamep, and she has held or holds visiting professor titles uh, in several universities and research institutions around the world. And she has published extensively on the law of the sea, uh, international energy law and environment, as well as uh, on issues related to migration. Uh, Maria, before you start, let me um, pose a question that has been set out for you, which you can integrate in your, in your own discussion. And that is, what is the general situation on business and human rights in Greece, both in terms of the legal framework and in terms of the general awareness among the legal community? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elias, and such a pleasure uh, to see you again after such a long time. You've noticed uh, that um, uh, I have uh, many hats uh, and this is perhaps one of the ways that we need to address business and human rights in Greece. We do come from different directions. Uh, we carry along uh, a, a lot of important information, important baggage, if you like. But what we have failed to do so far in the country as a whole uh, is actually to uh, bring together a comprehensive policy on business and human rights that would actually serve us in the present situation and uh, clearly in the future. Um, let me uh, explain. Um, Elias has already suggested that we lack in this country major enterprises. Um, it is true, we do not have that many major enterprises. We do have some, however, several uh, enterprises that have uh, shown um, an extrovert character where the enterprises that can be found uh, the world over. And that of course includes shipping, but on, not only shipping. Um, we found ourselves in the past decade uh, in a major retrenchment operation due to the financial crisis, 10 years of crisis that we have gone through, uh, the Greek enterprises moved inwards. They uh, left uh, the major neighborhood uh, that was the Balkans, they left uh, traditional markets and they had to buckle in, uh, trying to, sh uh, to save themselves really and save their employees as well. That really meant that we are missing out the international character. It is not, and it is only now that our enterprises are again moving away. Um, construction, uh, the construction sector, for instance, is very active in the Arab world. Um, and um, we try again uh, to see the challenges that, for, for human rights that are coming from this international deployment. What kind of baggage do we bring into these challenges that would help us actually uh, to articulate uh, a comprehensive response? Well, um, we have been, uh, Greece has been traditionally present in the international field. Uh, as you know, uh, there, is, uh, the there are negotiations going on for an international uh, treaty on business and human rights. Um, Greece is not very active on that field uh, to a certain extent because the European Commission is taking the lead and therefore we are sort of hiding behind um, the European front. Um, but um, we have been extremely active and we have been historically very active in several other things. For instance, um, uh, one of the uh, fora that has been extremely active in this field is the OECD, 
uh, with the OECD guidelines for multilateral enterprises. Uh, Tatiana would talk more about that, but uh, let me remind you for the time being that Greece is one of the founding members of the OECD and we have been there from day one. And indeed, this mechanism has been a significant contribution um, uh, with uh, by, by um, Professor uh, Argiris Faturos, who was on one of the big names of international economic law. Um, his work is actually reproduced in this uh, mechanism, and uh, uh, Greece has been there from day one. Greece is also a party uh, to numerous human rights conventions. And we also participate in treaty bodies uh, and uh, both internationally in the UN context and clearly in the Council of Europe, the regional context. Um, we have therefore long experience and expertise in treating situations that have to do with human rights challenges. And these all would be very, very useful uh, in bringing about uh, the economic aspects of, of business and human rights. The same is true about uh, the ILO conventions and generally labor conventions. The same is true to a certain extent about environmental conventions where we are now uh, more and more active uh, into the discussion about uh, the mechanisms involved uh, with the Paris Agreement or even the SDGs, the Sustainable Development um, uh, Goals. Um, the same is true about the bribery conventions. I have the privilege to work on bribery issues uh, for the past 15 years, and, uh, and we have been very, very active on all those fields involved with the mechanisms, in other words, with the nitty gritty, the, the everyday operation uh, of things that where you can really uh, understand the impact of, of regulations into uh, everyday affairs, into uh, the lives of, of uh, people, but also uh, the impact on the development of corporations and the way they, they, they carry out um, uh, business every day. Um, we have been uh, very active right from the beginning in the context of the European Union in terms of uh, corporate social responsibility. Maria Alexei would be able to tell you more about that. Um, and uh, indeed, the active in the negotiation about the EU directives on transparency. So um, all the elements of the problem are there. What we are missing, and I think this is a challenge that uh, we are currently picking up and uh, we would be able to deliver in the immediate future, is to put all those threads together and create a comprehensive legal and practical environment in which um, Greek enterprises would be able to flourish uh, once we get out of this uh, amazing experience that we're all living through the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. This is, this is interesting because, I mean, evidence, empirical evidence effectively shows that, uh, um, you know, corporate violations only occur in countries that have weak regulatory... Uh, re in fact, you know, the empirical evidence clearly shows that uh, these violations can take place by countries operating in, in developed uh, countries, but when they transfer their operations abroad in, in developing nations where the re regulatory regime is weak or lax and there is a race to the bottom. Um, our next speaker is Tatiana Leonardo. Tatiana is head of the Unit for International Services, Trade and International Investment Policy and Stable Development uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Greece. She's responsible for the operation of the Greek National Contact Point for the OCD guidelines for multinational enterprises referred to uh, by Maria in her, uh, her discussion. Tatiana, the question for you is, uh, the OCD guidelines uh, offer certainly the longest standing mechanism for reviewing corporate conduct, especially through the operation of national contact points. Would you like to explain how the system works in the Greek context? The floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for this opportunity to analyze the OECD's approach and due diligence uh, and present the Greek uh, NCT. 
Uh, the OECD guidelines for uh, multinational enterprises uh, are indeed the most comprehensive uh, responsible business conduct international standard and the only one with a built-in grievance mechanism, the national conduct point. Uh, the guidelines reflect the government's expectations uh, from their economic operators to act responsibly, both in the territory of their country, but also abroad. Uh, the guidelines cover all key areas of business responsibility, including human rights, but also labor rights, environment, bribery, fair competition, consumer protection, um, technology transfer, taxation. Um, currently, apart from the OECD members, 12 or more countries are adherent to the guidelines and obliged to establish a national uh, contact uh, point. Uh, the role of the national conduct points is uh, twofold. The one is the promotion of the implementation of the guidelines. The OECD approach on the responsible business conduct is uh, based on the risk-based due diligence. This means that the companies not only should uh, strive to make positive contributions to the economic uh, and social progress, uh, but also they are obliged to identify, prevent and mitigate the adverse impacts that may arise from their operations. The role of the NCTs, in line with the risk-based due diligence, is uh, to raise awareness and to provide special guidance uh, uh, for the implementation of the guidelines by the companies. Uh, moreover, the NCTs act as a um, an amicable dispute resolution mechanism between the companies and the complainants. The complainant could be NGOs, uh, trade unions, or individuals, in cases where the proper implementation of the guidelines is in doubt. Uh, there is a dedicated human rights chapter in the guidelines, uh, which uh, is fully consistent with the stress two elements that related to the human rights protection uh, in the guidelines. Uh, the first is extension of the due diligence requirement uh, to the multinational I think we may have a sound issue. Is it just me or is it everyone? Uh, no, we have it here. Maybe uh, maybe there's a connection issue. Okay, let's uh, let's give Tatiana a minute, and um, if she can't get back, then 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 we continue with our next speaker. Can you hear me? Uh, is there a connection problem? Yes, Tatiana, but we can hear you well now, so you can you can carry on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have a, a diversification of the complainants in some scans for issues so which go beyond the labor rights. And uh, we have um, multiple companies involved because of the obligation of due diligence in the supply new chains. Uh, the Greek NCP has been transferred to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since uh, 2019. Uh, the unit of the general directory of, uh, of the general secretary of the international trade and economic uh, relations, confirming its character as an integral part of the country's international economic and investment policy. The NCP's role uh, is compatible with uh, compatible to the parallel activities of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in promoting the human rights agenda. Uh, we can mention, um, for instance, the International Virtual Conference Organization last promote uh, the OECD guidelines. And also we can obtain feedback concerning their implementation from the Greek companies operating abroad. Our priority at this uh, stage as an NCP is uh, promoting activities uh, concerning ability, which means um, raising awareness about the guidelines and the NCP's role and providing guidance for their implementation, and also networking by, establish, by establishing a stable advisory body 
consisting of uh, the stakeholders' representatives, and also a uh, network of focal points in other, in other public authorities. We believe that it's important to uh, inform and to integrate the guidelines in all the areas of uh, public uh, policy. In parallel, the Greek NCP has drafted rules of procedure uh, prerequisitive for the predictability and transparency of its uh, procedures. They provide an explicit presentation of the NCP's role, the steps of the examination of a case, uh, the preconditions for the admissibility, as well as the amicable resolution procedure in cooperation with the Hellenic Mediation and Arbitration Center. Uh, the rules of procedure of the Greek NCP will soon be publicly available, um, accompanied with the necessary information, documents, and forms. So this is for for now for me. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, of course, the you know the NCP uh, and the uh, industry convention mostly relates to uh, multinational, actually only to multinational corporations. Uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm still unclear about about the, about the the question I posed at the beginning about whether or not and to what degree, let's say, uh, medium um, enterprises in a country like Greece would be amenable to, to following you know uh, guidelines such as those of the OECD uh, because of the you know there's no reputational damage if they do not. I mean, it, the, the damage would be kind of localized and very small. Um, um, thank you, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, next, uh, Maria Alexiu uh, will be um, uh, will be taking the floor. Maria is uh, chair of the board of directors of CSR Alas, a non-profit making business association representing 140 companies. Uh, she's also the member of member of the board of directors of CSR Europe. She has worked with different sectors and multinational companies such as Nike and uh, Titan, uh, Titan Cement, to form and implement collaborative initiatives leading to new integrated management practice and standards to monitor and assess impacts and performance outcomes. Uh, she has significant experience regarding corporate sustainability and responsibility, as well as trends and priorities in different regions with 30 years experience in business and stakeholder engagement. As an active member of the CSR Europe community, Maria has set up local business networks focusing on sustainability and CSR in Greece, as well as the Balkans, the European Business Alliance for CSR, the European Pact for Youth and the adoption by the Greek EU presidency in 2014 of the uh, EU NFRD in 2014. And of course, transposing the directive in, uh, in national laws. Maria, the question posed to you is, uh, is this, the Greek corporate community has an excellent record on social corporate responsibility. And I understand that you are using established channels to move further into business and human rights considerations and more specifically, the practical application of due diligence in the supply uh, chain. If you could give us some information about that, would be excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, a great uh, opportunity. We have to share our experiences and expertise uh, on this very, very important topic. Let me remind you that uh, we started talking about CSR almost 30 years ago when globalization in the form we know it today started really um, becoming a pre the prevailing model, economic model uh, in our planet. Uh, when in 2000, uh, Kofi Annan, the Secretary General uh, of United Nations then, invited multinationals within the spirit of the OECD, OECD guidelines for multinationals that was actually the first uh, legal instrument you might consider that was naming and defining corporate social responsibility as an as important element of globalization. When uh, Kofi Annan then invited uh, big multinationals to sign up for the nine um, common and uh, let's say well evidenced in international uh, regulations and guidance documents, uh, principles for uh, the global compact. Uh, these including respect for human rights, respect for labor rights and respect for proactive action uh, to uh, protect the environment we could see that not only in Greece, but also worldwide, 
businesses were taking not a, a very easy stance against the issue of human rights. So let me start by saying that although CSR was related from the very beginning with globalization and the issue of human rights in global supply chains, this is the, the issue that we first have addressed, the need to have a more, let's say, a, a regulated approach to the way companies operate beyond borders, we still today, 30 years after that, uh, feel very reluctant to speak about human rights uh, in the corporate world. And this is not only the issue in Greece. Human rights are considered a very much, uh, very much a political issue, an issue related to the, to the culture and the level of democratic uh, rules in every country. So this is a general comment that, that I would like to share with you. And from my experience so far, uh, either in the textile sector that was among the first sectors, economic sectors, to be victimized for human rights abuses and to burden, let's say, the, 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 the need to address human rights in the supply chains in order to manage uh, the risks uh, that are related to that. And the risks are not only related to corporate uh, image and corporate, uh, let's say, branding. Uh, there are a lot of impacts when a company is really um, um, victimized or related to human rights abuses. There are also issues related to business continuity, I must tell you. So the, the real impact is really very, very important. But at the same time, because as I said, it is a political topic, it remains uh, difficult uh, to discuss about uh, how uh, really companies address these issues. The last 30 years we have experienced a tremendous really amount of legislation produced. We have uh, developed standards to help companies actually to take commitments and to address these very, very, uh, let's say sensitive issues both within their sphere of influence, which, as you know, it is defined by, let's say, the, the, the laws we have uh, as the, uh, the, the, let's say, operations of the company, where the company has management uh, liability, but uh, also beyond the sphere of influence. And this was the aspect, actually, we had first experienced when actually the UN Global Compact principles I mentioned earlier were signed up by not only the 50 first uh, multinationals, but also uh, as of today from more than 10,000 small and medium, but also large enterprises worldwide. And the question is, what are these companies uh, doing? How they really uh, deliver against a commitment as defined by, let's say, these general guidance documents uh, we have currently at our own um, use um, to uh, understand, first of all, the impacts. What are the impacts? What are the impacts uh, from ac actions that a company take in order to operate? But what are the impacts also from uh, non-action taken? from what we call that uh, when a company ignores to take an action like to, uh, let's say, to uh, adopt a whistleblowing policy that will allow the top management to be informed about incidents that are uh, maybe abuses of human rights within its own sphere of influence, within its own operations. And now if we think that for a large enterprise, it's really an investment, but it is a worth, uh, a, a really worth investment to organize its own legal department, first of all, but also its own uh, uh, internal systems, both to monitor 
the conditions that we have in operations that can be uh, related to human rights issues, but also um, with the risks that uh, human rights issues may uh, occur uh, in the supply chain, um, we can understand uh, that for sure for small and medium-sized enterprises, even to be aware of what the law is today re in relation to these issues, what are the international standards are about these uh, issues and how a company can co com com comply with such standards is impossible. It's really impossible. I work for large companies and I, I have the privilege to, to really build on this uh, the last 30 years and work with the standards and to work with the legal instruments. And I can tell you for sure that it can be feasible, maybe for large companies to follow up, but it is absolutely impossible to expect that small and medium-sized enterprises can really invest themselves, each one of them, to be able to, first of all, understand, second, put the systems in place, third, control, and last but not least, find solutions. Because for some topics that we have to face, we need to build new solutions. No company by itself can really solve some of the problems. And allow me to give you one example from my experience from a multinational company like Titan. When we had to build a new project, Greenfield project in uh, Albania, a, car, a country that the, the, the local laws really are not in compliance with international standards. And this is a reality and for, for many countries, for some topics, this is a, is a, a common issue. Uh, the project was, uh, uh, let's say, delegated to an international uh, construction company coming from China. So we had uh, uh, the challenge to implement a very, very complicated and complex project by managing uh, people, managing systems, managing also, uh, let's say, responsibilities uh, that should follow, according to the contracts, to the contract law, certain requirements of certain jurisdictions to communicate to your contractors and your suppliers of services from other countries, from other legal regimes, what are the 10 global compact principles and how they are applied in practice, what was said in the beginning. It is not only to have the law in my hands, how am I going to make this law uh, the framework that I will operate? This is a very key question. And of course, there are no manuals. We have standards and guidances. We have no manuals right now to turn what we describe in our legislation into real uh, action and to also help people to understand how they take action. So for me to have today uh, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, to have the 10 global compact principles, to have the UNGP, and also to have uh, this in a more mature format, because as in the case of CSRLS, for example, our work is doing that, is taking, for example, the standards like the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights and translate them into an understandable framework of action for companies. Make the law, uh, let's say, translate the law in the language that people in business can speak and understand. And we need a lot of support from academia to do that. We need the know-how from organizations like OECD to help us transform the legal standards into practices and business ethics. Another issue though is that as said already, this is a small market and this is a kind of isolated market 
marginalized market within a, a region that is called European Union and in a global supply chain. So we have the, major, the, the majority of our companies being small and medium sized enterprises, not directly exposed to the international norms and standards that are developing, lacking of motives. And of course, what the Secretary General, Mr. Kurmus said is really very, very important. The motives as the criteria in public procurement will educate business, will help business to understand what is happening and to move towards the right direction. Otherwise, through the new legislation that has, is coming also from European Union, we are in danger. We are in danger to extinct because all these companies that cannot understand today why human rights is important. They can understand what they can do about human rights. They will disappear. This is what is going to happen. And this is the great danger because by imposing stricter laws, which we all agree we need them to have a clear, consistent, responsible, legal framework to operate, we endanger to create uh, this type, to increase this marginalization and, company, uh, and companies in Greece who are left behind to disappear. So my question is what we can do together to help companies to understand what has changed and why it has changed and to give them the tools that they will be able to adjust. Transformation is here already and the COVID, which is a very much issue related to human rights and protection of health, protection of health of our employees as well, of our communities is here and we'll have to solve the problem. So I believe we have the legal instruments. Today we have more than, more than 300 standards for, for, for corporate social responsibility. But we need action. We need to support companies to take action. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. One of the, I think one of the conspiracies in international law is that uh, you know, we don't ask individuals to, you know, to transform the law to adapt their personal behavior, do we? We don't ask them for you know human rights obligations. You know, these are owed by the state. So, but 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 you know, there's a you know, we, we try so hard to ask corporations to apply something different to what states are doing, when the reality is that state corporations have absolutely no obligation to follow any human rights, none whatsoever. That was never even on the table ever. You know, the only obligation of human rights is for states, and so states must adopt these in their own domestic sphere and then implement them. And if they implement them, then the only thing that corporations need to do is to follow the law. Really, that's all they have to do, follow the law. No, they don't have to do anything more than that, follow the law. But you know, the problem here lies in extraterritorial application of the law and, and states are very, very unwilling to do that. You know? If they did that, then there would be no race to the bottom in the developing world. Uh, very interesting presentation, Maria. Thank you very much. I learned a lot from that. Uh, last presentation is from uh, Athena Sahulidu. Athena is an assistant professor in criminal law at the Nova School of Law in beautiful Lisbon and vice director of the research center uh, CEDIS. Her academic research has focused in the past on doctrinal approaches to criminal liability and punishment of legal persons and on questions related to corporate accountability for wrongful actions with special regard to financial crime. Her current research project focuses on the intersection of criminal justice and new technologies. Uh, such as uh, um, uh, artificially, artificial intelligence driven technologies that are employed for law enforcement and criminal justice purposes. And your question, Athena, uh, is this. Due diligence requirements involve criminal liability for legal persons, but Greece is probably the last country in the European Union with no such liability. What are the EU requirements with regard to corporate accountability for criminal acts? How did the Greek legislator respond to these? The floor is yours. So it's officially the time to talk about the consequences. Thank you very much, uh, Elias. Uh, I'm really delighted to join this wonderful panel with esteemed colleagues and practitioners. And I also have to admit that I have learned uh, so far a lot of things from the previous presentations. 
Let me start by noting that this is an easy question when it comes to the European environment and a very tricky one when one seeks to delineate and assess the Greek situation. The, the Greek situation. Um, although we are attending a webinar on business and human rights, um, one should know that the European legislator has been motivated to regulate corporate accountability for criminal actions by the increase of financial crime. And why is that? Because this is a type of crime that has a direct impact on the member states' interests and the interests of the European Union itself. However, over time, the number of the legal instruments that push the member states towards the adoption of corporate sanctions has increased. And now it also covers fields that pertain either directly or indirectly uh, to the field of business and human rights. Uh, this is the case of the rules on environmental crime. This is the case of the rules on uh, human traf uh, on trafficking in human beings, etc. cetera. Uh, what do we find in the European law is minimum standards with regard to the subjective scope of liability. So what kind of corporations can be held liable and which cannot, for instance, those who do take on exclusively public tasks, the mode of establishing liability to what kind of actions or omissions do we look at, the relation between individual and corporate liability, the prevailing model is the parallel one, the, the model of parallel liability, and last but not least, the burning question, the sanctions that are applicable to legal persons. And here, actually, we have a great margin of appreciation. Uh, the European legislator has granted a great discretionary power uh, to the national legislator. So what we are required to do is to introduce effective, proportionate, and dissuasive sanctions, no matter if those are to be classified as criminal ones or administrative ones. The only real limitation is our duty to impose monetary sanctions, financial sanctions. Every other kind of sanctions, such as the exclusion from entitlement to public benefit, judicial supervision, temporary or permanent closure of establishments are just alternatives. And before we address the reaction of the Greek legislator, is worthy to highlight which is the very idea behind this scheme. And here is where we find the respect of national, cultural, social, historical roots of the different EU jurisdictions. So Maria Alexiou was absolutely right when saying that many stuff that we seek to regulate, including human rights, are really, really connected with our social identity, with our cultural identity. And the apparatus of sanctions belongs to those uh, specific fields of regulation as well. So what has been the reaction of the Greek legislator? A quite a uh, dubious reaction. So the Greek legislator has been influenced a lot by the doctrinal debate taking place uh, among the Greek academics with regard to the very idea of having a non-human actor being held accountable before a criminal court and for a criminal act, which is considered a human behavior. Um, of course, um, the fact that the Greek legislator has put a lot of attention on the doctrinal problems has not eliminated the pressure under which he was and he is to regulate the liability of corporations. And that said, he came up with four different solutions and all of them are applicable at the same time. First one, he has introduced the criminal liability of the legal person representatives. This, uh, of course, is a solution very uh, common and very compliant with the very structure of criminal law, which focuses on human behavior. What's the problem here in the reality is that the description in law does not always match the reality in corporations. So the duties that are described in law 
and uh, those are actually important elements of criminal liability are not to be found in court decisions that seek to describe what is actually happening in a corporation. And this is why a lot of court decisions stemming from criminal uh, uh, courts are often overturned due to lack of proper justification. The second solution that we find in the Greek environment is a solution to be uh, actually classified under the umbrella of civil law. We are talking about the joint liability of the corporation as a legal person and the natural persons that are the perpetrators of the criminal act. Um, and we are talking about a joint liability for paying the fines that are imposed either on the legal person or on the natural person. This is maybe the more old school solution that we find in the Greek environment. And it's worth it to know that nowadays we have only very few provisions on this kind, um, uh, of this kind being valid. Third solution, uh, back to the field of criminal law, the Greek legislator has designed some criminal provisions the subject of which is described in a more abstract way under the label the employer, the producer, the constructor, etc. Meaning that the subject, the perpetrator of those crimes can also be a legal person. However, given the fact that we haven't recognized the corporate criminal liability as a concept, at the end of the day, the judge is again gonna look for a natural person, for a manager, for an employee, who was behind the illegal behavior of the corporation as an entity. And uh, moving towards the end of this brief presentation, the fourth solution, which represents the basic tool of corporate liability in the Greek environment. And here we are talking about administrative sanctions. Um, all the previous speakers talked about the specificities of the Greek environment, saying that we are talking about a marginalized market, uh, which mostly has medium and uh, small size enterprises. And here we are in front of another specificity of the Greek environment. Greece is the only country together with Bulgaria and Slovakia solely applying, uh, solely imposing administrative sanctions. Another example is Germany for the time being, but Germany is currently under process of modifying this kind of law. And Germany is gonna join the group of the countries who do apply a hybrid model, a model of sanctions that can be placed between administrative and criminal law. And here we are talking about procedural guarantees. Uh, but I'm not gonna bother you, uh, bore you with uh, so technical details. So back to the administrative sanctions. What we have here, we have two different kinds of provisions. Those stemming, originally stemming from the Greek legislator, and these are the most problematic ones. Why is that? Because in those provisions, we do not find any further rules regarding the establishment of the liability. So the scheme might be pretty easy. We have the administrative sanction corresponding to a violation of administrative law. And the very same violation also constitutes a violation of criminal law corresponding to a sanction to be imposed against a natural person. Really easy in theory, really hard to apply, to enforce when the administrative law does not contain any rules, any specific rules on the establishment of the liability. The second kind of provisions that we have are those stemming from the European legislator. We are talking about provisions into which European rules are imposed. And here we have more specific rules on the establishment of liability. What's the problem in the real world? These two types of provisions do coexist sometimes in the very same law. And I have already noticed that we have uh, a lot of Greek um, citizens or speakers uh, among our um, participants. And this is why I'm gonna give you a very concrete example. If you look at law number 1650s uh, of 1986, don't be afraid, this was recently amended. We are talking about the law on environmental violations. You are gonna find in article 28, 
the very first kind of provision, and in Article 30, the very second kind of the provisions that I was talking to you about. Both of them do impose, do threaten very, very high sanctions. Sanctions can be up to 2 million euros. So imagine these two kinds of phenomena coexisting, over-regulation, low uncertainty, and on top of that, draconian measures. And I hope that we are going to have some time uh, in the second round of questions to talk about, to give you a bit of more details about the real risks associated with this environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Athena. This was interesting. I think it's one of the issues that has come up in the last 20 years, you know, even at the European Union level, when discussing, um, uh, you know, criminal measures and sanctions at, 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 at different, you know, stages and, uh, and variations, that the criminal ability of the corporation has always become an issue, uh, or of legal persons at least, has become an issue. And, you know, of course, in the European Union and the OECD, there is a, you know, there's a, there is a recognition that different legal systems work in different ways, but you've explained this really, really well. Uh, uh, that you know there there are serious problems not only in unifying these uh, the liability of the corporation but also at the domestic level trying to kind of uh, avoid conflicts in the laws and, and legal uh, certainty as well. Um, now we will continue. I, I don't see any specific question. There's one by by Sean Morris. He posed it to, to Maria, uh, and Maria responded uh, on the on the chat. Uh, so I don't see anything else. So I'll ju just go with the question that I have here. And if we have time in the end, then we can then, then have a, a Q&A or speakers can, can speak their mind. So this is from Maria. It is clear that business human rights obligations refer to a wider context of international obligations and the rule of law. How would that work in practice? Well, so many Marias, I presume you are referring to me as Maria. Yes, yes, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that is really the issue, isn't it? Uh, by just listening to us so far, it is easy to realize that uh, what is the problem right now is that in each particular area of law or practice, uh, we somehow concentrate on what it is uh, in front of our eyes, now a little box um, and, and we lack the interconnections. So we, uh, corporate uh, social responsibility operates within certain major enterprises and uh, it works well, but it works there. Uh, you have small and medium enterprises that really have a capacity problem. And keep in mind that uh, when we're talking about um, small and medium enterprises in Greece. We're talking about enterprises of one up to 50, and for this would actually come in and correct me if I'm wrong, whereas in the European uh, context, we're talking about 250 and 500. Uh, a, a corporation with 500 employees in Greece would be a major corporation. So there's the rain lies immediately. Um, a problem uh, which needs to be addressed. And it is one of the reasons why um, we do have more and more calls and hopefully even incentives. And again, Fortis would be able to help us later on on that, um, trying to uh, have a smaller uh, corporations either merge into a bigger corporation that would be able to sustain these kind of uh, obligations or develop into a bigger corporation uh, so that we can actually have a decent response in these kind of obligations. Uh, it is, however, understood across the board that uh, the piecemeal approach is not working anymore. And that we need the kind of horizontal uh, initiatives that would um, involve every stakeholder in the same uh, situation. So um, it is a discussion that is happening both in Greece and worldwide with special emphasis in, in the European Union. Uh, and in the European Union, we are moving, and I, I'm sure that you have all followed the discussion so far, into a rule of law mechanism. 
And uh, the idea of the rule of law mechanism was uh, politically motivated, as all things are uh, at this point. Uh, it had to do quite a lot with certain member states that were somewhat ambivalent as to their obligations. Uh, it has developed, however, and we're about to see uh, to see that in practice uh, into a major review of obligations. Um, uh, the current mechanism on the rule of law, as already um, indicated in the first reports, national reports prepared by the European Commission, expands onto two onto four different levels. Uh, the first one is um, uh, judicial um, independence. The second one is checks and balances. Uh, the third one is freedom of expression. The fourth one is corruption. And corruption really relates to corporate. The corporate world is not simply political corruption. It's, it's actually a much wider level of lawlessness and, and uh, uh, the level playing field pretty much along the, the lines that the corruption um, treaties were initially created by mostly by the OECD as a means to create this level playing field for businesses. And the, 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 the idea actually of uh, uh, the rule of law mechanism is nothing more and nothing less than a comprehensive review of all activities that would actually come along to uh, indicate, to explain how this uh, rule of law applies in practice. How do you translate these big words into practical steps? Well, with a lot of procedures. Um, a first procedure would be the obligations for transparency. Um, we already have directives and uh, there's a new one brewing as we speak. And the idea is that in addition to uh, economic data, financial data, all major enterprises, and when we're talking about major enterprises, we're talking small, medium and major enterprises, would up to a certain, beyond a certain level, of course, not the very small ones. Therefore, the Greek ones, question mark, uh, uh, all these enterprises would be obligated to uh, uh, report uh, on their non-financial activities. In other words, they would have to talk about the way they treat uh, their workers, they treat uh, uh, their contractors, uh, they would have to talk about environmental policies, uh, they would have to talk about uh, corporate, uh, internal corporate policies, they would have to talk about uh, uh, the idea of corporate governance, uh, they would have to talk about whistleblowers and everything under the sun. In this way, where you uh, have to put on paper whatever it is that you have to, to whatever it is that you have done, uh, the immediate question is: Is there anything that you can put on paper? And therefore, indirectly, um, that obligation acts as an awareness raising uh, um, tool uh, that would make you enter the field of these non-financial uh, obligations. Um, nobody suggests that this is a, an easy process. And this is the reason why um, CSR has been around for 20 years and we're still struggling with it. Um, it is extremely useful, however, to see whether we can come up with new tools or employ older tools for a new purpose. For instance, human rights impact assessment. Human rights impact assessment was a tool that was mostly employed by the government and governmental authorities. It was available out there for a number of years. Um, several governments have used it. Others have really, forgotten to use it. 
Um, the European Commission suggested that they are about to make it uh, mandatory uh, in the past few years, uh, and uh, we are still following up on the way they do it. And uh, the pandemic would be a major way, a major test to see how this goes. Um, so clearly, uh, this is an element uh, that we need to follow up. Um, and um, I, would, I would actually uh, put these two out there. Um, procedural obligations reporting, because that is a mechanism that one can check and that would actually create incentives for companies to comply. And second, um, human rights impact obligations that are incumbent of both both on the state and the corporations, and thus uh, are useful to bypass this conundrum that Elias has been talking about, the idea that the state is obligated and the companies simply um, play free. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Maria. I I'm gonna break protocol slightly. Uh, uh, we have a few questions coming in, and I think they're more interesting than the ones that I have on, uh, on DOC at the moment. And uh, so uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll pose those. I mean, the, the, there are many, so I'll just have to choose a few. But this one is for uh, Maria Alexiou. I think it's more appropriate. So uh, the question is, uh, to what degree are human rights impact assessments used uh, in Greece prior or after an operation, both domestically and, and abroad? Uh, if you can keep your, your, your response to maybe three or four minutes maximum, that would be great, Maria. Thank you. Uh, I don't know many human rights impact assessments to be performed as such, apart from cases that has been a part of the obligation, which is not from what I know. However, uh, from recent reg regulations, it has been uh, proposed to include uh, social impact assessments uh, in uh, specific projects and particularly when this happens is uh, a new project. In any case, as Maria earlier said, is a very uh, useful instrument. Uh, although this instrument by itself, uh, I can tell you is not enough because all this type of assessment are considering um, a state maturity of uh, stakeholder engagement, which is really necessary. To make it more clear, for example, when we have, let's say, to consider um, uh, taking the license to a new drilling of oil in Mediterranean Sea, which is a topic, uh, it is a huge question uh, whether for making this decision, we take a proactive stance to uh, um, assess the potential impacts, because it's in, 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 in the new, let's say, projects is very, very critical to address from the beginning all the impacts. So no, we don't have this as a practice. I know that, for example, uh, for the transformation of the um, uh, airports, the local airports, there were social impact assessments, but not human rights impact assessment. And allow me to tell you that from what I know and from the maturity we have in Greece on these topics, if we don't specify, we do this for that and this is what we expect to be the, the, the regulatory framework advancing further from the corporate, uh, let's say, side. We are not going to have this in a voluntary basis. What we have, though, we have more and more companies, small and medium sized enterprises, although it is not even a practice yet to report on these issues following the, the, the recent EU uh, reporting corporate reporting framework, we have a, a tendency in local uh, small and medium enterprises to take the commitments following the 10 global compact principles, which is also the minimum uh, level of communication expected according to the directive, and to have more and more companies to, to, to start reporting. 
it is evident that when you start reporting and measuring or um, explaining what you do, you will start then doing uh, more to uh, understand, so to assess your impacts and see where you really have material human rights impacts. Because this element of materiality, as also the element of maturity, are both very critical for the implementation of the instruments we have available. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I have a, there are a number of questions relating to a specific topic, which I'm going to summarize. Uh, and this, this is for uh, uh, Mr. Kormousis, I, I believe he's, a, he's, he's uh, best suited for this one. So the, the questions are generally around this topic. So uh, in public procurement, if companies uh, do not have a good human rights record, then they've got a competitive advantage over, over other companies. And also, you know, if they don't stick to the rules, then what, what kind of rules would you, are there available or uh, would, be, would be suitable uh, in situation of public procurement to, to avoid providing an undue advantage to companies with a record of violating human rights? First of all, uh, according to Greek law, every candidate for public procurement must fulfill all Greek legislation. Thus, if somebody has uh, violated the Greek legislation uh, on human rights or on various other aspects, environmental and social aspects, then uh, this is uh, an, uh, a reason to be excluded from the tender. Uh, furthermore, uh, if a company has, uh, uh, let's say, a better progress in human rights after fulfilling the, the minimum requirements of the law, and another company has, let's say, a worse performance but still meets the minimum requirements of the law, then in this case, uh, those two companies will be evaluated during the public procurement tender. And, uh, and, and, this, um, and this assessment has a very significant uh, percentage in the overall scoring. It amounts to approximately 30%. So uh, if I compare two companies, one that, uh, let's say, only uh, performs in fulfilling just the requirements of the law. And uh, another company has exceeded these requirements and performs better, for example, by implementing the international standard. Then the second company uh, will have a 30% better scoring. This means that uh, the second company can submit a higher uh, proposal, I mean a higher cost, uh, to a point of 30%. So a com uh, the first company may submit an application of uh, a lower cost, up to 30%, and still not get the tender. So this is a financial incentive for companies to, 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 to try and incorporate uh, the, the requirements of international standards and not just try to evade it by submitting uh, tenders with lower cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question for uh, Tatiana. Uh, the question is, you know, what, what is, the, uh, what, what is the, um, the status of the UN guiding principles in Greece? Uh, the, um, uh, the person posing the question asked, the Greek government had a few years ago indicated they would develop a national action plan but no progress has been made uh, to date. If you could keep your, your answer to three or four minutes, Tatiana, that would be great. Thank you. Well, uh, um, thank you for this question. But uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I am the right person to answer this question because the National Action Plan for the Human Rights, uh, the UN Human Rights, uh, is not our responsibility. Uh, OECD has uh, incorporated in the guidelines for multinational enterprises the chapter in, in the specified chapter has incorporated the principles of the United Nations, but is uh, not in any case responsible to um, uh, to draft a national action plan in this uh, area. 
So probably uh, some other from the panel. I think Maria wanted to do. I think Maria wanted to respond to this. Okay, Maria, Alex, you. Yes, I can respond to this. Yes, uh, actually, the, uh, uh, for minutes, the last five years, we are working uh, with um, special training programs that are focused on uh, developing internal, internally inside the large Greek enterprises. Um, uh, the know-how and expertise needed to implement uh, the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. We have such exams of practice. Actually, the first seminar was hosted two years ago uh, at Titan premises uh, from Titan, internal trainers that were developed uh, to meet this uh, priority we were coming from the legal department, from the procurement department, from all the departments represented key functions, because allow me to say that human rights, um, as well as CSR, is not the, the issue of uh, the CSR department or the sustainability department, is the issue of the top management and all the organization. So all functions and operations are involved. We need to build internally skills and competencies to implement, as I said earlier, what the legal framework describes and even beyond, moving beyond that. Uh, so uh, this kind of training we run uh, with other big uh, uh, companies in Greece. And I think we are getting better in having internal systems linked to compliance, linked to legal, but also, but also linked to uh, remedy uh, processes that allow now companies in Greece and uh, starting with the large, we expect that this will be a positive, uh, let's say impact for the smaller ones to address uh, specific human rights issues within the sphere of uh, corporate influence, like diversity, for example. And we have now um, more thematic focus we are getting mature. I'm afraid we don't get as mature as fast as it is expected to go, because I think you will maybe also agree the last five years, things have really uh, start moving much faster and becoming much more demanding than it have been the last, the previous uh, decades. Thank you, thank you, Maria. Uh, one final question to uh, to Athena, uh, and that is, and this is the closing question, I suppose. Athena, do you, do you think that the criminal law, you know, alone suffices, or you know, to what extent does it is it uh, can it solve the problems related to uh, business human rights? Thank you very much, uh, Elias. And actually, this is a great question. Uh, to answer not just with regard to business and human rights, but in general, criminal law is never enough. And criminal law isn't should be the last resort of every single legal order. It should be the very last solution to work with, given its very special nature, given its intervention in the fundamental human rights of uh, the perpetrator, him or herself. And uh, back to the Greek reality and to the system that we do have when it comes to addressing violations of human rights that do also constitute crimes. And here we are dealing with four different risks. First one, when we are talking about natural persons, we shouldn't take for granted that this natural person, this uh, human can always be identified in the corporate context. Sometimes the structures are so complicated that liability is spread around the, uh, the space, let's say. Second scenario, and this is also a very unfortunate one, Sometimes we do have individuals becoming very convenient scapegoats within corporations. In, in very extreme cases, they are even hired to take on the responsibility if everything goes wrong. Third risk that is a bit more general. Uh, nowadays, not just the Greek legislator, but the international legislator as, as a more abstract persona, uh, stands before a huge challenge to regulate and to address violations of human rights, not just in the corporate context, but also in the context of digitalization. 
could you imagine such a multi-layered and complicated framework be implemented in an even more complicated context, like the one of intersection of law uh, and technologies and human labor and new technologies? And once again, back to the Greek bureaucracy, I, uh, I have already referred that one of the major problems is over-regulation, which causes low uncertainty. This has a major impact on the procedural and the due process rights of uh, the perpetrators of the uh, accused persons. And if we want to talk about money, this also seriously demotivates future investors to choose the Greek market to transfer their, their business there. So if I have to close this presentation with a single proposal, this will be the adoption of a coherent and comprehensive framework of sanctions, no matter if we call them administrative or criminal. I also belong to those saying that using criminal law tools to describe the behavior, metaphorically speaking, of a non-human actor is very tricky, is very challenging. So even if we don't use, we don't want to find ourselves trapped in those doctrinal dilemmas, administrative context can work on the condition that we have concrete rules and enforceable rules. There is no point in threatening a corporation with a 2 million fine if you never cash this money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Athena. This is this is wonderful. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants, as, as well as uh, Mr. Kormuz. I know we're taking up uh, a lot of his time uh, for this, but it was a you know a great a great panel. I enjoyed I enjoyed sharing it. Uh, there's a lot to be done, uh, of course. I've got you know I've got uh, and we we finished on time, which is amazing. I've got uh, four hours of classes coming up now, and three kids banging on the door, which is uh, so not 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 quite easy. But I'm sure it's the same for everyone back home. I would like to thank also Nova University and the British Institute of International Comparative Law and Claire for hosting this. Uh, we're grateful to her and Shields has the, uh, the final word. Claire, it's, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elias, for this fantastic sharing. Thank you so much to uh, the fantastic panelists for this uh, very interesting and insightful uh, presentations and for sharing uh, with us uh, your insights. Thank you to uh, uh, Mr. Kotis Fotis Kotumusis for having um, spent the time with us today. Um, I would also like to thank all the uh, participants and apologies uh, for uh, the slight issues at the beginning with the connecting links, but um, uh, I trust that it's all in order now and uh, the webinar uh, has been registered, as I mentioned, the, registr the uh, registration will be, the video will be made available on the uh, website of the NOVA Centre, so you will be able to catch up what you might have uh, missed at the very beginning if you would like to. Um, so that concludes our webinar series on uh, business and human rights development in Southern Europe. It's been extremely interesting uh, for me to see the similarities, but also the differences uh, amongst the different countries. Um, some of the, just picking up on, on some of the common features that I have found, uh, that idea that was raised by uh, Atina of the overregulation, which we find uh, uh, very um, in a lot of, uh, of countries, uh, in particular in Southern Europe, but yet the lack of an overarching framework on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence and uh, perhaps um, linked to that also uh, a low uptake of um, the expectations, uh, the, in particular the due diligence expectations by companies. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind the, 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 the majority, the very vast uh, majority of companies uh, in uh, most countries, especially in Southern Europe, are small and medium enterprises. We've talked about that today and, and sometimes even very small companies. And also thinking when we think also at the European level and the legislation, the legislative initiatives that are coming, what it might look like, what human rights due diligence and environmental due diligence might look like for these companies, I think will also be crucial uh, in practice. 
Um, so that leaves me to, again, thank everyone. And I would like to also mention our new uh, upcoming webinar series. Uh, as you might know, Portugal has recently taken up the presidency uh, of the Council of the European Union. And so in collaboration with the Portuguese presidency, we're organizing here at Nova School of Law a webinar series which will look at the legislative developments at the European level um, and in particular the introduction of uh, a corporate due diligence duty and how this connects to other fields. Um, we heard today um, about criminal liability, administrative liability, civil liability. Our first episode will be on the connection between corporate due diligence and civil liability uh, John Ruggie, the author of the UN Guiding Principles on uh, Business and Human Rights, will give the keynote speech. Um, the, you will find in the chat uh, the details to register to these events if uh, that is of interest on the website of the NOVA Center for Business, Human Rights and the Environment. So um, again, thank you again to all the attendants, to all the panelists, to the chair. Uh, to our keynote speaker, and I wish you all uh, a very nice rest of the day. Bye-bye.